chapter one of the fire people this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by tony oliva the fire people by ray cummings chapter one the coming of the light the first of the new meteors landed on the earth in november nineteen forty it was discovered by a farmer in his field near brooklyn massachusetts shortly after daybreak on the morning of the eleventh astronomically the event was recorded by the observatory at harvard as the sudden appearance of what apparently was a new star increasing in the short space of a few hours from invisibility to a power beyond that of the first magnitude and then as rapidly fading again to invisibility this star was recorded by two of the other great north american observatories and by one in the argentine republic that it was comparatively small in mass and exceedingly close to the earth even when first discovered was obvious all observers agreed that it was a heavenly body of an entirely new order the observatory at harvard supplemented its account by recording the falling just before dawn of the eleventh of an extraordinarily brilliant meteor that flamed with a curious red and green light as it entered the earth's atmosphere this meteor did not burn itself out but fell still retaining its luminosity from a point near the zenith to the horizon what the farmer saw was a huge fire burning near the centre of his field it was circular in form and about thirty feet in diameter he was astonished to see it there but what surprised him more was its peculiar aspect it was still the twilight of dawn when he reached the field he beheld the fire first from a point several hundred yards away as he explained it the light for it was more aptly described as a light than a fire extended in parallel rays from the ground directly upward into the sky he could see no line of demarcation where it ended at the top it seemed to extend into the sky an infinite distance it was in fact as though an enormous searchlight were buried in his field casting its beam of light directly upward but more than all this the farmer was struck by the extraordinary color of the light at the base it was a deep solid green this green color extended upward for perhaps fifty feet then it shaded into red the farmer noticed too that the fire did not leap and dance with flames but seemed rather to glow a steady light like the burning of colored powder in the morning half-light it threw a weird unearthly reddish-green glow over the field the farmer approached to within twenty feet of the light he looked to see what was burning but could not determine for the greenish base extended directly down into the ground he noticed also that it gave out extraordinarily little heat the morning was not exceptionally cold yet he stood within twenty feet of the fire without discomfort i was on the staff of the boston observer at this time i reached brooklyn about noon of the eleventh of november and went directly to the field where the fire was burning nearly a thousand people were there watching by daylight the fire still held its green and red color although its light was much less intense it held its characteristic shape though clearly definable under the rays of the sun it became quite transparent looking through it i could see plainly the crowd of people on the farther side of the field the effect was similar to looking through a faintly tinted glass except that now i noticed that the light had a sort of crawling motion like the particles of a heavy fog the fire came from a hole in the ground by daylight now the hole could be seen plainly for some moments i stood silent awestruck by this extraordinary spectacle then a man standing beside me remarked that there was no smoke i had not thought of that before but it was true indeed the fire appeared phosphorescent 
let's get up closer said the man beside me together we walked to within ten feet of the outer edge of the fire we could feel its heat now although it was not uncomfortable except when it beat directly on our faces standing so close we could see down into the hole from which the light emanated lying at the bottom of the hole perhaps ten feet below the surface i saw the jagged top of an enormous gray sphere burned and pitted this was the meteor nearly thirty feet in diameter that in its fall had buried itself deep in the loam of the field as we stood there looking down into the hole someone across from us tossed in a ball of paper it seemed to hang poised a moment then it shriveled up turned black and floated slowly down until it rested on top of the sphere someone else threw a block of wood about a foot long into the hole i could see it as it struck the top of the sphere it lay there an instant then it too turned black and charred but it did not burst into flame the man beside me plucked at my sleeve why don't it burn he asked i shook myself loose how should i know i answered impatiently i found myself trembling all over with an unreasoning fear for there was something uncanny about the whole affair i went back to brooklyn soon after that to send in the story and do some telephoning when i got back to the field i saw a man in front of me carrying a pail of water i fell into step beside him what do you suppose it'll do he asked as we walked along god knows i answered try it but when we got down into the field we found the police authorities in charge the crowd was held back now in a circle a hundred yards away from the light after some argument we got past the officials and followed by two cameramen and a motion picture man who bobbed up from nowhere walked out across the cleared space toward the light we stopped about six or eight feet from the edge of the hole the heat was uncomfortably intense i'll make a dash for it said the man with the pail he ran forward a few steps splashed the water into the light and hastily retreated as the water struck the edge of the light there came a roar like steam escaping under tremendous pressure a great cloud of vapor rolled back over us and dissolved when the air cleared i saw that the light or the fire of this mysterious agency was unchanged the water dashed against it had had absolutely no effect it was just after this incident that the first real tragedy happened one of the many quadruplanes that had been circling over the field during the afternoon passed directly over the light at an altitude of perhaps three thousand feet we saw it sail away erratically as though its pilot no longer had it under control then it suddenly burst into flame and came quivering down in a long lengthening spiral of smoke that night the second of the meteors landed on the earth it fell near juneau alaska and was accompanied by the same phenomena as the one we were watching the reports showed it to be slightly smaller in size than the brooklyn meteor it burned brightly during the day of november twelfth on the morning of the thirteenth wireless reports from alaska stated that it had burned out during the previous night meanwhile the light at brooklyn was under constant surveillance it remained unchanged in all respects the next night it rained a heavy pelting downpour for a mile or more around the field the hissing of steam could be heard as the rain struck the light the next morning was clear and still we saw no change in the light then a week later came the cold spell of nineteen forty surpassing in severity the winters of eighteen eighty eight and nineteen eighteen it broke all existing records of the weather bureau the temperature during the night of november twentieth at brooklyn fell to thirty degrees below zero during this night the fire was seen to dwindle gradually in size and by morning it was entirely extinguished no other meteors fell that winter and as their significance remained unexplained public interest in them soon died out the observatories at harvard flagstaff cordoba 
and the newer one on table mountain near cape town all reported the appearance of several new stars flaring into prominence for a few hours and visible just after sunset and before dawn on several nights during november but these published statements were casually received and aroused only slight general comment then in february nineteen forty one came the publication of professor newland's famous theory of the mercutian light as the fire was afterward known professor newland was at this time the foremost astronomer in america and his extraordinary theory and the predictions he made coming from so authoritative a source amazed and startled the world his paper couched in the language of science was rewritten to the public understanding and published in the newspapers of nearly every country it was an exhaustive scientific deduction explaining in theory the origin of the two meteors that had fallen to earth two months before in effect professor newland declared that the curious astronomical phenomena of the previous november the new stars observed the two meteors that had fallen with their red and green light fire were all evidence of the existence of intelligent life on the planet mercury i give you here only the more important parts of the paper as it was rewritten for the public prints i am therefore strongly inclined to accept the theory advanced by schiaparelli in eighteen eighty two in which he concluded that mercury rotates on its axis once in eighty-eight days now since the sidereal revolution of mercury i e its complete revolution around the sun occupies only slightly under eighty-eight days the planet always presents the same face to the sun on that side reigns perpetual day on the other the side presented to the earth as mercury passes us perpetual night the existence of an atmospheric envelope on mercury to temper the extremes of heat and cold that would otherwise exist on its light and dark hemispheres seems fairly certain if there were no atmosphere on the planet temperatures on that face toward the sun would be extraordinarily high many hundred degrees hotter than the boiling point of water quite the other extreme would be the conditions on the dark side for without the sheltering blanket of an atmosphere this surface must be exposed to the intense cold of interplanetary space i have reason to believe however particularly from my deductions made in connection with the photographs taken during the transit of mercury over the face of the sun on november eleventh last that there does exist an atmosphere on this planet an atmosphere that appears to be denser and more cloudy than our own i am led to this conclusion by other evidence that has long been fairly generally accepted as fact the terminating edge of the phases of mercury is not sharp but diffuse and shaded there is here an atmospheric penumbra the spectroscope also shows lines of absorption which proves that mercury has a gaseous envelope thicker than ours this atmosphere whatever may be its nature i do not assume tempers the heat and cold on mercury to a degree comparable to the earth but i do believe that it makes the planet on its dark face particularly capable of supporting intelligent life of some form mercury was in transit over the face of the sun on november eleventh of last year within a few hours of the time the first meteor fell to earth the planet was therefore at one of her closest points to the earth and this is significant was presenting her dark face toward us at this time several new stars were reported flashing into brilliancy and then fading again into obscurity all were observed in the vicinity of mercury none appeared elsewhere i believe these so-called stars to be some form of interplanetary vehicle probably navigated in space by beings from mercury and from them were launched the two meteors that struck our planet 
how many others were dispatched that may have missed their mark we have no means of determining the days around november eleventh last owing to the proximity of mercury to the earth were most favorable for such a bombardment a similar time is now once more almost upon us because of the difference in velocities of mercury and the earth in their revolutions around the sun one synodic revolution of mercury i e from one inferior conjunction to the next requires nearly one hundred and sixteen days in eighty-eight days mercury has completed her sidereal revolution but during that time the earth has moved ahead a distance requiring twenty-eight days more before she can be overtaken after the first week in march of this year therefore mercury will again be approaching inferior conjunction and again will pass at her closest point to the earth we may expect at this time another bombardment of a severity that may cause tremendous destruction or destroy entirely life on this planet End of chapter 1chapter two of the fire people by ray cummings this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by tony oliva the unknown enemy when in february nineteen forty one professor james newland issued this remarkable statement my paper sent me at once to interview him he was at this time at the head of the harvard observatory staff he lived with his son and daughter in cambridge his wife was dead i had been acquainted with the professor and his family for some time i first met his son alan during our university days at harvard we liked each other at once and became firm friends possibly because we were such opposite physical types as sometimes happens alan was tall lean and muscular an inch or so over six feet with the perfect build of an athlete i am dark alan was blond with short curly hair and blue eyes his features were strong and regular he was in fact one of the handsomest men i have ever seen and yet he acted as though he didn't know it or if he did as though he considered it a handicap i think what saved him was his ingenious ready smile and his retiring unassuming almost diffident manner at the time of the events i am describing alan was twenty-two about two years younger than i it was his first year out of college he had taken a scientific course and intended to join his father's staff beth and alan were twins i was tremendously interested in beth even then she seemed one of the most worthwhile girls i had ever met she was a little wisp of femininity slender and delicate hardly more than five feet one or two she had beautiful golden hair and an animated pretty face with a pert little snub nose she was a graduate of vassar and planned to take up chemistry as a profession for she had the same scientific bent as her father and brother i called upon professor newland the evening of the day his statement was published and found all three discussing it you want me to talk for publication don't you bob trevor the professor asked suddenly after we had exchanged a few pleasantries he was a wiry little man about sixty smooth-shaven with sparse gray hair a rugged face of strong character and a restless air of energy about him he was an indefatigable worker indeed i am confident that for any single continuous period of work without sleep he could have run alan and me into the ground and still have been comparatively fresh you want an exclusive follow-up story from me to-night don't you he repeated i admitted that i did what you'll get won't be just what you expect look at this he pulled one of the evening papers toward him vigorously they think it is humorous there read that the item to which he pointed was a sprightly account of the weird beings that might shortly arrive from mercury they think it's a joke some of them 
there's another read that the attitude of the press was distinctly an inclination to treat the affair from the humorous side i had seen indications of that during the day at the office look here bob the professor swept all the papers aside with his hand you put it to them this way make them see this is not a prediction of the end of the world we've had those before nobody pays any attention to them and rightly so but this mercutian light is more than a theory it's a fact we fought it last november and we'll have to fight it again next month that's what i want to make them realize they'll think it's worth being serious about alan put in if one of those lights drop into boston or new york especially if it happens to play in a horizontal direction instead of vertical we went into the whole subject thoroughly and the professor gave me a second signed statement in which he called upon the nations of the world to prepare for the coming peril the actual characteristics of the mercutian light we had discussed before several times a good deal had been printed about it during the previous december without as i have said attracting much public attention the two meteors had been examined they were found to be of a mineral that could have originated on mercury they were burned and pitted like other meteorites by their passage through the earth's atmosphere of the light itself professor newland had already given his opinion it was he said some unknown form of etheric vibration it radiated heat very slightly but it had the peculiarity of generating intense heat in anything it touched directly you'd better explain that father said beth when we reached this point in our summary that evening heat is the vibration of molecules of matter the professor began i nodded make it clear when you write it up bob alan put in it's like this all molecules are in motion the faster the motion the hotter the substance and vice versa and this mercutian light beth added has the power of enormously increasing the molecular vibration of anything it comes in contact with but it doesn't radiate much heat itself alan finished professor newland smiled the old man doesn't have much of a show does he alan sat down somewhat abashed but beth remained standing beside her father listening intently to everything he said this light i conceive to be the chief weapon of warfare of the mercutians the professor went on there has been some talk of those two meteors being signals that's all nonsense they were not signals they were missiles it was an act of aggression i tried to get him to give some idea of what the inhabitants of mercury might be like for that was what my editor chiefly desired at first he would say nothing along those lines that is pure speculation he explained and very easy speculation too any one can allow his imagination to run wild and picture strange beings of another world i don't predict they will actually land on the earth and i have no idea what they will look like if they do land as a matter of fact they will probably look very much like ourselves i see no reason to doubt it like us i ejaculated why not said alan conditions on mercury are not fundamentally different from here we don't have to conceive it any very extraordinary sort of being to fill them here is what you can tell your paper said the professor abruptly take it down i took out my notebook and he dictated briskly regarding the possible characteristics of inhabitants of mercury it is my conception that intelligent life let us say human life wherever it exists in our universe does not greatly differ in character from that of our own planet mars venus mercury even neptune are relatively close i believe the creator has constructed all human life on the same general plan i believe that being neighbors if i may be permitted the expression it is intended that intercourse between the planets should take place that we have been isolated up to the present time is only because of our ignorance our inability to bridge the gap 
i believe that migration friendship commerce even war between the inhabitants of different planets of our solar system was intended by almighty god and in good time will come to pass this is not science and yet science does not contradict it in my opinion human life on mercury venus or mars may need bodies taller shorter heavier lighter more fragile or more solid than ours the organs will differ from ours perhaps but not materially so the senses will be the same in a word i believe that nearly all the range of diversity of human life existing on any of the planets exists now on this earth or has existed in the past or will exist in the future through our own development or at most the differences would not be greater than a descent into our animal kingdom would give us mercutians may have the sense of smell developed to the point of a dog the instinct of direction of the homing pigeon the eyes of a cat in the dark or an owl in the light but i cannot conceive of them being so different that similar illustrations would not apply i believe the creator intends intercourse of some kind friendly or unfriendly to take place between the worlds as china was for centuries so for eons we of this earth have been isolated that time is past the first act was one of aggression let us wait for the next calmly but soberly with full realization of the danger for we may be indeed i think we are approaching the time of greatest peril that human life on this earth has ever had to face End of chapter two chapter three of the fire people by ray cummings this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by tony oliva the landing of the invaders march eighth nineteen forty one was the date at which mercury was again to be an inferior conjunction at her closest point to the earth since her transit over the face of the sun on november eleventh of the previous year during february after professor newland's statements the subject received a tremendous amount of publicity some scientific men rallied to professor newland's support others scouted the idea as absurd officially the governments of the world ignored the matter entirely in general the press editorially wrote in a humorous vein conjuring up many ridiculous possibilities of what was about to happen the public followed this lead it was amused interested to a degree but as a mass neither apprehensive nor serious only curious in some parts of the earth among the smaller latin nations particularly some apprehension was felt but even so no one knew what to do about it where to go to avoid the danger for the attack if it came at all was as likely to strike one country as another the first week in march arrived with public interest steadily increasing mercury always difficult of observation presented no spectacle for the public gaze and imagination to feed upon but all over the world there were probably more eyes turned toward the setting and rising sun during that week than ever had been turned there before professor newland issued no more statements after that evening i have described he was taken with a severe cold in the latter part of february and as beth was in delicate health and did not stand the northern winters well the whole family left for a few months stay at their bungalow home in florida they were quite close to the little village of bay head on the gulf coast i kept in communication with them there the eighth of march came and passed without a report from any part of the earth of the falling of the mercutian meteors satirical comment in the press doubled 
there was indeed no scientific report of any unusual astronomical phenomena except from the harvard observatory the following morning there professor newland's assistant professor brighton stated he had again observed a new star an interplanetary vehicle as professor newland described it only a single one had been observed this time it was seen just before dawn of the ninth then about four p m atlantic time on the afternoon of the ninth the world was electrified by the report of the landing of invaders in the united states the news came by wireless from billings montana an interplanetary vehicle of huge size had landed on the desert in the shoshone river district of northern wyoming west of the bighorn mountains this strange visitor it was described as a gleaming silvery object perhaps a hundred feet in diameter had landed near the little mormon settlement of byron the hope that its mission might be friendly was dispelled even in the first report from billings the characteristic red and green light fire had swept the country nearby a horizontal beam this time and the town of byron was reported destroyed and in all likelihood with the loss of its entire population the boston observer sent me to billings almost immediately by quadruplane i arrived there about eight o'clock on the evening of the tenth the city was in a turmoil ranchers from the neighboring cattle country thronged its streets a perfect exodus of people mormons and oil men from shoshone country almost the entire populations of cody powell garland and other towns near the threatened section the indians from the crow reservation at franny all were streaming through billings the wyoming state airplane patrol gathered in a squadron by orders from cheyenne occasionally passed overhead flashing huge white searchlights i went immediately to the office of the billings dispatch it was so crowded i could not get in from what i could pick up among the excited frightened people of billings and the various bulletins that the dispatch had sent out during the day the developments of the first twenty-four hours of mercutian invasion were these only a single vehicle we called it that for want of a better name had landed airplane observation placed its exact position on the west bank of the shoshone river about four miles southwest of byron and the same distance southeast of garland the country here is typically that of the wyoming desert sand and sagebrush slightly rolling in some places with occasional hills and buttes the chicago burlington and quincy railroad runs down its spur from the northern pacific near billings passes through the towns of franny near the border of montana and wyoming and garland and terminates at cody this line running special trains throughout the day had brought up a large number of people during the afternoon a bomb of some kind it was vaguely described as a variation of the red and green light rays had destroyed one of the trains near garland the road was now open only down to franny the town of byron i learned was completely annihilated it had been swept by the mercutian light and destroyed by fire garland was as yet unharmed there was broken country between it and the mercutian invaders and the rays of the single light which they were using could not reach it directly such briefly was the situation as i found it that evening of the tenth in billings we were sixty-five miles north of the mercutian landing place what power for attack and destruction the enemy had we had no means of determining how many of them there were how they could travel over the country what the effective radius of their light fire was the nature of the bomb that had destroyed the train on the c b and q near the town of garland all those were questions that no one could answer billings was during those next few days principally a gathering place and point of departure for refugees yet 
so curiously is the human mind constituted underneath all this turmoil the affairs of billings went on as before the stores did not close the billings dispatch sent out its reports the northern pacific trains from east and west daily brought their quota of reporters picture men and curiosity seekers and took away all those who had sense enough to go the c b and q continued running trains to franny which was about fifteen miles from the mercutian landing place and many of the newspaper men most of those in fact who did not have airplanes went there that first evening in billings roland mercer a chap about my own age who had brought me from the east in one of the boston observer's planes and i decided on a short flight about the neighboring country to look the situation over we started about midnight a crisp cloudless night with no moon we had been warned against venturing into the danger zone several of the wyoming patrol and numbers of private planes had been seen to fall in flames when the light struck them we had no idea what the danger zone was how close we dared go but decided to chance it to fly sufficiently high for safety directly over the mercutians appeared difficult since the light fire already had proven effective at a distance of several miles at least we decided not to attempt that but merely to follow the course of the c b and q southwest to cody then to circle around to the east and thence back north to billings passing well to the east of the mercutians we started as i have 